Okay, good morning. Uh, welcome to the bioatmospheric nitrogen cycle. Um, our conveners are myself, Meredith Hastings, uh, Rebecca Riles, and Maya Alvarez could not make it, but they were instrumental in uh, putting this together. And it's our sweet 16 for this session. We've been doing it for 16 years, so hearty mazel tov, and we can get, a, uh, we can get our learner's permit now. <laughs> so why do we do this session? Because nitrogen is fiendishly complex. It's the most common limiting nutrient in, on the planet. Crosses air, land, and water in all directions. It crosses scientific disciplines, and AGU is by far the best place to interact between uh, deep disciplines. And we all need to understand what's happening upstream and downstream of us in the nitrogen cascade. A lot of obvious and not so obvious degradation of environmental quality. And it really is the biggest global environmental change almost nobody has ever heard about outside of this room and the scientific community. Uh, it's illustrated with the Planetary Boundaries, published in 2009. Here's nitrogen down here in the red, exceeding the planetary boundary. The only thing that comes close in their take on things is biodiversity, the extinction crisis. And I happen to work right at the interface of the two of them. So a little bit about the session. Uh, Sue Trumbor, who is a biogeoscience section president, uh, said the best thing you can do for AGU and participate is to organize a session and invite your friends. AGU makes it really easy to do that. Uh, it's great organizational. Put in your session proposal and it's a vote of the people. <laughs> and we've been really successful. So we've had close to 600 talks and posters since 2003 in this session. Um, I always like to decrease the carbon to nitrogen ratio of AGU because that always leads to higher quality. <laughs> uh, we put in for the Centennial Challenge and we're on AGU On Demand. So uh, you'll actually be able to see these talks again. Uh, this year we got 50 plus abstracts. We have three oral sessions here for the rest of the day so you don't have to go anywhere. And then our posters are on Tuesday and that's going to give us the chance to hit stage four nitrogen saturation, as I call it, by tomorrow morning. So now I'm going to launch into my talk about looking at groundwater nitrogen, nitrate, in the serpentine grassland ecosystem. So it starts with the butterfly, the bay checker spot butterfly is listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Lives on this really just gorgeous flower-filled habitat uh, grow on serpentine rock, very nutrient-poor soils, and the flower diversity includes the host plants and nectar sources for the butterfly. Uh, I've been working out there a really long time. This is my field crew, uh, hard at work above Silicon Valley, counting flowers in the spring. Uh, we noticed a long time ago, back in the 1980s, that when the traditional land use down here, which is rangeland, when the cattle were pulled, Suddenly, there was this incredible growth of non-native annual grasses, especially Italian ryegrass. So uh, we knew what was going on, at least in an empirical, so cows eat grass. They maintain the biodiversity, and we have happy California cows and happy wildflowers here. The driver of this is the atmospheric nitrogen deposition blowing in from Silicon Valley and beyond. We're at the south end, and the prevailing winds tend to be from the northwest. Uh, and it's, uh, it's an ongoing problem. So in 2002, this is a site on Tulare Hill, our most highly, uh, most polluted site, actually. Um, and then a few years later, after the cows were pulled because of a dispute between a couple of adjacent landowners, that's what it looked like. So we lost the biodiversity, and we have thatch and annual grass. So this all led to the de uh, development of a habitat conservation plan. Santa Clara Valley Habitat Agency uh, administers the Valley Habitat Plan, which is a habitat conservation plan and a natural communities conservation plan. 
The ultimate goal is to acquire and manage about 46,000 acres for 19 covered species. More than half of them are serpentine related and serpentine takes up about 25% of the acreage. Total cost over 50 years, $665 million. That's $13 million a year. Um, this is Silicon Valley, so that's really rounding error in the Silicon Valley economy, but it's a lot of money for conservation. The plan was adopted in 2013, and there's a novel nitrogen deposition fee that was based on new daily car trips and comes out to a little less than $45 per new single family residence, and it's one time uh, generate about $10 million over the plan. So we, we want to understand the long-term trends of nitrogen deposition. So the idea of monitoring spring water nitrate uh, came up. We know nitrate leaching is a really strong indicator of nitrogen saturation. We want to know how much is in the spring and stream waters and how does it vary in space and time. Is there a correlation with deposition gradients? What fraction is unprocessed atmospheric nitrate that's just flushing right through the system? Uh, what's the future trajectory of nitrogen deposition? And can spring water nitrate be used for long-term monitoring? So we went out in 2015 and 2016 and started sampling springs. Uh, we've sampled many more than are on this map now. Um, there's literally like probably over 100 springs in this area. Uh, serpentine is really a, a spring-rich uh, geologic formation. Uh, an example of one of our springs, we have this, there's a cave, we call it a cave in this uh, grove of trees here. Uh, somebody had dug out a cave as a water supply, uh, so we get a, uh, my field crew actually went swimming in it this summer on a really hot day and they said it was really nice. Uh, a lot of watering troughs, these are good places to sample because we're getting the groundwater directly out of the spring boxes. Uh, then we also have surface water, like the headwater seep, or a little further downstream along the street. So we have a variety of different sites. Uh, our first round of sampling was pretty revealing. Uh, we have some sites that are at half the drinking water standard. And this is just coming off a of rangeland. Um, and then, you know, wide variety of uh, nitrate concentrations. Uh, um, can't go too much into detail on it, and some sites have a lot, some sites have less, and there are reasons for it that we've been able to untangle. And uh, thanks to collaborating with Meredith here, we were able to run the uh, Cap Delta 17.0 and estimate that between 50 and 65 percent of the nitrate that's showing up in the spring water, spring water is unprocessed atmospheric nitrate that is just flushing right through the system. Um, and it's related to the uh, overall concentration. We also see a lot of temporal variability. We've sampled uh, over the course of the past three years, high levels in the dry seasons, end of the dry seasons, levels go down in the winters, a dilution effect, we think, and comes back up during the dry season. TH1 and VTA1 are tracking each other really well. NC4 is actually a stream, it has a rather large catchment, um, and that shows a somewhat uh, more variable. So uh, this is uh, after a very, very wet month. This is an old mine pit that filled up with water, so there's a lot of water in the groundwater system, and we know exactly where the water table is here at this point. And, uh, we found there was no atmospheric nitrate in this. It had been flushed out. And we also decided we needed to avoid sampling in the rainy season because it was just simply too variable. So let's look a little bit at the deposition environment here. Uh, the brown cloud. Uh, we did some passive sampler uh, measurements, looking at nitric acid, ammonia, and nitrogen dioxide. Uh, about between 30 and 50 percent in these South Bay sites is coming in the form of nitric acid vapor. That's the source of the atmospheric nitrate, and it accumulates over the course of the summer dry season. Uh, the TDEP project 
product from the EPA is just fantastic for looking at composition and trends. Uh, it's kind of spatially coarse, but we're down in this area, so you can see it's showing a really strong gradient from the middle of San Jose down into the more rural areas. And what's really good about Tdep is it breaks it down by species. So Tdep is telling us the light blue is the nitric acid vapor. The dark brown is the ammonia. It's a lot of ammonia in Silicon Valley uh, coming from vehicles. And uh, so we have a sense of you know, what the fraction of the different uh, chemical species are coming down. So when that gets into the ecosystem, first we need to know what the nitrogen cycling is like in the ecosystem. So in September and November, sort of at the end of the dry season, beginning of the rainy season, we have really high levels of nitrate and ammonium in the soil. Uh, that's because even though it's dry, there's a lot of microbial activity over the summer, but there's no uptake. Uh, by February, things are growing big time, so the nitrate and ammonium levels you know, go way, way down. And then it starts coming up again in May. So this is the time of year uh, when there's a lot of nitrate, but there's not a lot of plant demand at that point because it's the very beginning of the growing season. So we're really set up for nitrate leaching here. Um, and. Our total annual plant uptake is estimated about 20 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. We have deposition rates, you know, 10 or more in some of these areas, so a really substantial uh, part of the nitrogen input. The soil series, uh, about 30 centimeters deep, only 60 millimeters of available water capacity. So once we get above 60 millimeters of rain, you know, plus a little bit to account for ET, uh, we're in the set at the point where we can start leaching all that accumulated nitrate. Um, the soil scientists stop when they hit rock. So we need to know what's going on in the rock. So that means digging, but we didn't have to dig. The Kirby Canyon landfill excavated an entire canyon to fill it up with garbage. Um, and we had to, uh, extensive hydrogeologic studies to understand the, the water. So we perused their uh, information and we can't, they published uh, groundwater velocities. Um, in this layer of colluvium, alluvium and colluvium up on the top that's one to four meters thick, uh, they estimate water flows between 40 and 70 meters per year and about 92% of the water is flowing through that layer. We have this layer of weathered serpentinite where much tighter, about one meter per year, and about 8% of the water is flowing through that. And that's six to nine meters thick. And we get into the unweathered serpentinite, which is really tight. And the velocity of groundwater is well less than, a, less than 0.1 meter per year. It basically sticks around. So we can take those velocities, do a little bit of GIS here, to get the catchment of the springs, and get the distribution of the distances. So here's two different catchments, VTA1 and C10. You can see about 500 meters, and VTA1 is the maximum extent. NC10 may be more like 250 meters. So when we uh, plug those velocities in to the VTA1 watershed here, uh, at 40 meters per year, we're getting, you know, it's kind of a maximum of about 10 uh, 10 years transit time, uh, 70 meters per year, we're definitely down in four or five on average. So uh, we are seeing a well-integrated signal over five or maybe 10 years. So that's a uh, short enough time that we think it's a really good method for uh, tracking the long-term nitrate. And then we have fracture flow, which is gonna really decrease these uh, residence times. So the trends in nitrogen deposition um, from Tdep, which is from 2000, early 2000s to 2012, 2014, uh, we can see that the downward trend in nitric acid vapor, downward trend in other oxidized nitrate going down, ammonia is going up. It's another great use of Tdep. Uh, the emissions inventories show 
we've been really good at getting rid, getting the knocks down. Uh, regulation works, hello. And ammonia has been uh, pretty much holding steady. And we're expecting another 30% decrease in the NOx. So in summary, I'd like to, uh, the serpentine grassland is totally nitrogen saturated. The nitrate levels in the summer base flow from the springs are higher than any other non-ag system I've been able to find. If anybody knows of one more, please let me know. Uh, it does track spatial nitrogen deposition gradients. 50 to 60% of the summer base flow is estimated to be unprocessed atmospheric nitrate that's just flushing right through the system. The leaching potential because of the seasonality and the biogeochemistry is very high in the early season, and that's when the atmospheric nitrate is to, there to be leached. Mean groundwater residence times are less than 10 years and probably much less than that. So, and we have declining NOx and increasing NH3 trends. So we feel like we do have a good uh, simple method for tracking long-term nitrogen deposition and protecting this gorgeous ecosystem. If anybody's in California in the spring, look me up, I'll take you out there. And I'd like to thank uh, funders and supporters of this work over the decades. And I'd like to thank the Bay Checker Spot Butterfly in particular for leading me into this. Thank you. So our next speaker is Sammy Ula, talking about fine-tuning in situ measurements of denitrification and biological nitrogen fixation. Thank you for the invitations to talk about the measurement of denitrifications in biological nitrogen fixation uh, in natural and semi-natural ecosystems across a nitrogen deposition gradient, mainly in Britain and partly in northern Sweden. Uh, so denitrification, uh, biological nitrogen fixation is a nitrogen input process that reduces reactive nitrogen, uh, non-reactive nitrogen to bioavailable form, and it's uh, an in energy intensive process requiring 16 ATPs. Denitrification is mainly the, the output process in converting uh, nitrate into nitrogen gas, including nitrous oxide among uh, other gases. So this has been the natural sources uh, of nitrogen coming in and then going out of the ecosystems. Now with the industrial productions of ammonia and the, uh, the emissions of NOx from motor vehicles have uh, resulted in uh, super enrichment of, the uh, of our natural ecosystems. And the case is not different for the United Kingdom as well. Our nitrogen deposition gradient uh, ranges somewhere from background in northern uh, Scotland to up to 60 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. There are now some decreasing trends for the nitrogen depositions in UK, but that's still uh, high in many places up the critical thresholds for ecological uh, resilience in terms of six to 10 kilograms of nitrogen being deposited. And this is critical because in England and Wales alone, we have land use types which are natural or semi-natural, peat, moorlands, forests, and grasslands that constitute 50 to 80%. And so it raises the question, is denitrification capable of removing this deposited nitrogen? Uh, looking in the context of the budgets of these ecosystems, what would be the implications for nitrous oxide? And what happens to biological nitrogen fixation being an inten uh, intensive, uh, in energy intensive process? For biological nitrogen fixation, we he looked at the gradient of nitrogen depositions from Digero in Sweden, which is the northern limits within these PT uh, systems with background atmospheric deposition of two to uh, 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 higher depositions within the UK in selected sites. So the first thing we wanted to see how we measure it. So the, the usual method used as citadine reduction assay have been used extensively. So we wanted to know if that is applicable so we could use it across this diversity of sites. And then for that, we conducted parallel incubations of 15 into assimilations versus ARA to find a site-specific conversion ratio so we could do more measurements. For denitrifications, we picked up two catchments, the Ribble and Y. So 
two different catchments, one in Wales, one in England, and in each land use type. Then we went ahead and we selected organic RPT systems, a mixed woodlands, deciduous woodlands, semi-improved grasslands, not fertilized, grass a bit light, and improved grasslands which are fertilized and grassed relatively more intensely. Then within these land use types, we wanted first to establish the sensitivity of our denitrification measurements, adopting the 15 in gas flux method from Stevens and Laughlin. And we wanted to see how we could lower the limit of detections and still be able to measure denitrifications with low tracer enrichment levels. And for that, we injected highly labeled enriched nitrate into soils at low application rates, 0 0.3 to 0.5 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. But the amount delivered was adjusted not to increase the soil moisture content by more than 5%. And this way, then we established 40 plots within those two catchments and did uh, monthly measurements of denitrifications for 17 months. And after the injections, we enclosed the chambers, and then we collected gas samples at various time points. The samples were injected to IRMS, four microliters for dinitrogen gas, and uh, four ml for nitrous oxide. The N2 had a custom-built preparatory uh, system that enabled the, uh, uh, the removal of NO, CO, CO2 in water. Also, because during higher temperatures, endogenous or more NO is produced, we wanted to reduce or fully remove that amount to, uh, to avoid interference with R30, the ratio 30, uh, for dinitrogen gas. And with that system in place, our precisions for the instruments for uh, nitrogen, uh, dinitrogen was 0 0.08 per mil, and for nitrous oxide, 0.3 per mil. Our incubation systems, we had the minimum detectable flux tests of four microgram of N per meter square per hour established for nitrogen gas, and then 0.2 nanograms per nitrous oxide. And when compared to acetylene reduction, uh, uh, acetylene block technique, the 15 in gas, uh, 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 the 15 in gas flux rates were on average four times higher than the acetylene block uh, technique. So there seems to be an underestimation of denitrification in these systems using the acetylene block technique. Once we established this uh, uh, sensitivity of our systems, then we did the fuel measurements and our injections of the tracer mimicked daily and our depositions, react to nitrogen depositions in feed in forests and fertilizations in grasslands. The in situ denitrifications across these land use types from PT and organic soils are there to improve the fertilized systems. The total rates across these uh, land use types ranges from eight in PT systems to about 13 to 25 kilograms in, uh, in grass uh, land systems. And in terms of how much this process removes relative to in, to the, in our depositions, these forest in pit systems are only able to remove 50% of what's being deposited, so that's uh, increasing the likelihood of uh, chronic nitrogen saturation of these systems. The contribution of denitrification we measured here, so the total N2O emissions versus the DN2O, which is the nitrous oxide, the denitrification N2O contributions to the total is here. That varied across the land use types. Uh, uh, denitrifications are versus other processes, main denitrification, but we only were able with our tracer systems to, uh, uh, to segregate the denitrification component in that varied uh, across. Uh, the contributions varied from 8 to 60 percent, and more enrichment of these systems with nitrogen uh, reflects, are reflected in more into emissions. Soil moisture seems to have mainly regulated the, the balance between denitrification sources versus other sources across these land use types. It's by no means a comprehensive comparison, but it's just model rates of denitrifications across the globe. The scale is big. It's a per kilometer square of nitrogen being removed. But within the UK context, what's being modeled at this larger scale is between 15 to 195 kilograms per hectare. I just put it for comparison purposes, but the scales are different. We are just less than a uh, few, uh, less than a meter square plot uh, situations. But our rates, compared to what at this large scale uh, uh, are being shown, are quite different. So there seems to be a big potential for bringing together more measurements to enable, uh, to, to enable uh, and constrain the modeling of 
uh, nitrogen budgets. When I compared it to this uh, natural abundance 15 in fractionations with the Edith Weiss publication, so uh, for the United Kingdom, the rates reported in this study, and I got from, through personal communications from Edith, the mean rates are lower than what we measured here, but the maximum denitrification rates measured by Edith somehow get closer to our estimations. Anyway, these are the two pictures. We are somewhere there, but there is need for more measurements in tweaking around to enable a more accurate assessment of denitrification within these land use types. Now I switch to biological nitrogen fixation. So the first thing we wanted to, to compare the uh, acetylene reduction assay with the 15 in conversion ratios. The table is a bit boring in so much, but mm. lab incubations versus field incubations, and then over time 2016 or 2017 are uh, uh, in the three different sites, the Welsh, the English, and the Scottish sites for different sphagnum moss species. These are the median ratios. Overall, the ratios were not consistent by species, by site, or over time. Uh, <laughs> much lower than the theoretical ratios of three to one. And so we think that ARA is not suitable for BNF measurements in PT systems, uh, at least in the sites we looked at. This inconsistency in the ratios is probably reflected with the differential or partial separations of 15 in assimilations when we had the incubations with, uh, without, or with acetylene. So you could see when we add acetylene, it suppresses it, but not completely. In some cases, the suppression is quite high, being this is a log scale, but in some cases, it's not. So differential suppressions of 15 in assimilations in the presence of acetylene probably is the reasons for some of the variability of uh, the ratios uh, in nitrogen fixation. Now, from England, with the highest end depositions to Sweden, with the lowest end depositions, so we see a range of, uh, uh, these are the median values represented by the box plots, highly variable, but we see as the deposition decreases, uh, end fixation seems to, to enhance it. So there seems to be uh, a bit of a suppression of biological nitrogen fixations, but not a complete shutdown. And when we plot, sorry, when we plotted it, uh, 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 the median concentrations of fixations versus the nitrogen deposition gradients across our sites, we see a progressive suppression, but not complete uh, 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 shutdown of the process. And uh, s some of my modeling colleagues in the UK who did uh, uh, the catchment the, the scale measurements of catchment um, scale budgeting of uh, uh, nitrogen assumed uh, uh, no contributions of BNF in those systems, assuming that there is excessive nitrogen depositions. But it still goes on, and I think uh, it might be suppressed when we lose the species in response to end deposition. But as long as the sphagnum mass is there, and maybe methanotropy, which are responsible for about 40% of the, uh, 40 to 60% of end fixation, as long as the methanotrops provide that energy, BNF would go on. So it's rather indirect when we lose the species uh, through shading from sphagnum masses to shrubby vegetations, we may see the suppression indirectly, but directly as long as the masses are there, we don't see any evidence of a complete shutdown of the process. So the key points, uh, acetylene block techniques for denitrifications and ARF or BNF underestimates these in situ processes under field conditions. Denitrifications in the PT and forest systems removes up to 50% of the annual nitrogen depositions within these catchments, so risk of chronic nitrogen saturation. And BNF is suppressed but not completely shut down under NR depositions in these catchment systems. We believe in things that further fine tuning of the 15 in gas flux method uh, uh, and more measurements, especially temporally extensions, are necessary to further refine. Uh, uh, the dynamics of uh, the annual rates to enable uh, the, uh, uh, a close marriage between the modeling and the measurement uh, communities. And with this, I would like to thank uh, uh, the farming community, specifically who allowed us to, to access uh, those catchments for our research work and our funding agencies across Britain uh, and the National Trust as well as a key player in providing us access to catchment types. Thank you.
Okay, we have time for a question. Uh, I think with acetylene, so what we think is happening, it inhibits nitrification, it interferes with methanotropy, and it inhibits the reduction of N2O. So methanotropy and N2O might be the sources of energy. So if those are suppressed, then depending on the amount of methanotrops within the samples might lead to a variability within the uh, incubation system. So, uh, unless we have extracted fine enzymes, then probably their theoretical ratios could be achieved, but under fuel conditions, with the diversity of the species, uh, uh, microbial species that acetylene interferes with, it might be difficult under in situ conditions to, to constrain it. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, hope you'll be able to continue these types of discussions. Uh, our next talk is by David Clow, and it looks like we're getting back into some hydrogeology here. He's going to look at linking water transit times to catchment sensitivity to deposition in the city in the western U.S. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. What I'd like to talk about today is trying to link hydrology and hydrologic characteristics of watersheds to the sensitivity of those watersheds to atmospheric deposition of acidity and nitrogen. So um, for acidity, really what we're talking about is buffering of the acidity by mostly by mineral weathering reactions. For nitrogen, um, there are a host of processes involved, but um, I'm going to sort of lump them under nitrogen uptake or assimilation. So how, how does the hydrology relate to the ability of the watershed to buffer the acidity and take up the nitrogen? Um, here's a quick roadmap of my talk. I'll provide some background. Uh, then we'll talk about methods, results, conclusions, and I'll take questions. Um, and I forgot to mention, this paper was published in Hydrologic Processes this year, so if you want more details, you can go there. So um, this is an interdisciplinary session, so I thought it would be useful to describe uh, what, water tra what transit times are. I'm referring to the transit times of water. That is, how f how, what is the elapsed time between when a water molecule enters the watershed, that is, a, say for example a raindrop hits the ground and how long does it take for that raindrop to move through the catchment um, to the to the outlet of the watershed often that's going to be a stream gauge so it's the elapsed time why do we care um, Transit times have a large influence on just the, the movement of water, the advection of pollutants, for example, in the subsurface, if there is a point source of pollution that um, enters a watershed, and then let's say that pollution source is cut off, how long does it take for that pollutant to flush through the watershed? So pollution persistence. But also, and more importantly for this session, um, transit times, we think, have an influence on buffering capacity. Um, mineral weathering reactions are, can be described as rates, and so they intrinsically have a time component. That is also true of nitrogen uh, cycling processes. So um, transit time, um, you know, it's, it's a time uh, factor, and so because rates have time in them, we think that hopefully um, transit times might have an influence on our ability, uh, the watershed's ability to take up uh, acidity or nitrogen. That's our hypothesis. How do transit times vary spatially? This is an important question because um, we think that, well, previous work has shown that alpine catchments 
especially, are, are particularly sensitive to acidic deposition. Those watersheds, well, an example of those watersheds is shown in the uh, photograph, the upper photograph, that's the Marble Fort catchment in Sequoia National Park. The lower photograph is a, another catchment in our study, that is Sage Hen Creek, which is also in the Sierra Nevada in California, but um, it's further north and it has a lot more forest and a lot more soil, um, not very much alpine. So some of the previous work um, looking at nitrogen concentrations in stream water uh, that have used a geostatistical analysis have shown that nitrate concentrations often are correlated with the amount of barren terrain that is unvegetated terrain, so bedrock and talus in a watershed, um, so positive correlations with barren terrain, and negative correlations for nitrate versus percent forest um, in the watersheds. Our study involved 11 watersheds, which are shown on the map over on the uh, left-hand side. Um, and uh, those are all relatively pristine watersheds without water diversions. They're um, headwater catchments. Um, most of them are snowmelt-driven type systems. Okay, um, here's a little bit of hydrology for everyone. This is the flow, a flow duration curve. Um, we've got specific discharge on the y-axis and exceedance probability. That is, how often is discharge exceeded um, uh, for a given discharge. Um, and the important thing to note here is the shape of the curves. So when you have steep curves, for example, for the Marble Fork and the Merced River, um, we think, we hypothesize that those catchments would have short transit times. Whereas, um, where, where the curves are more shallow, um, like for Sage and Creek, um, there would be longer transit times. How do we actually quantify transit times? So the previous slide showed sort of a qualitative analysis. This is more quantitative. Um, we can use the seasonal variability in the O18 of precipitation and stream flow um, to calculate or quantify transit times. What we look at is the magnitude of the seasonal variability. So this, the graph in the upper right shows there's a lot of variability in the O18 of precipitation, and the, the graph in the lower part um, shows stream flow O18, and there's a much, well, um, the seasonal variability is damp, damped and lagged. And from the ratio, the amplitude ratio, we can calculate the transit time. Um, we can calculate a couple of different metrics. MTT, that's the mean transit time, which is something folks may have heard of. And then there's sort of a newer metric called the fraction of young water, which varies from zero to one, which describes the percentage of stream flow that is less than about three months old. Okay, so getting into some of the results, um, this graph shows mean transit time on the x-axis and then the young water fraction on the y-axis. You can see that the two metrics are inversely related. Mean transit times for our catchments ranged from, oh, about um, 90 days up to about six or seven years, but there's a lot of uncertainty. Young water fraction also varies quite a bit. Again, the Marble Fork and the Merced River have very short transit times. Those are the catchments shown in the photograph are exemplified by the photograph. Um, there's a lot of bare rock um, and not much vegetation or soil. Sage Hen Creek and Andrews Creek in Washington have relatively long transit times. These are catchments exemplified by the, uh, the second photograph with the, the meadow and the forest. Um, so, um, and, and what, what do the uh, transit times look spatially? Here's a map showing transit times, actually the young water fraction, excuse me, for all of our different catchments. Um, and if you look at, let's see if I can get this. Okay, so there's the Merced River and uh, Marble Fork. They have relatively a large fraction of young water in, in the stream water. And then Sage Hen is right here, and it has not so much young water. So 
The reason I, I asked the question, why, how does it vary spatially, is because we would like to be able to map the sensitivity of catchments to acid deposition or nitrogen deposition. Um, in order to do that, we can do a geostatistical analysis um, on our watersheds and develop predictive models. They rely on relationships between basin characteristics and um, whatever it is we're trying to predict. So here we've got um, fraction of young water and mean transit time on the y-axis and then a few different basin characteristics on the x-axis. We've got barren, percent barren uh, in the watershed, percent for a soil, and then also the basin, average basin slope. And you can see if we just focus on mean transit time, since that's sort of maybe easier to grasp, in the lower set of graphs, there's a, um, when you have a lot of barren terrain in the watershed, you tend to have short transit times. Same thing for slope. When you have steep slopes, you have short transit times. Conversely, when you have a lot of forest soil, that's this diagram here, when you have a lot of forest soil, your transit times tend to be relatively long. And I keep, I'm coming back again to our photographs, our, which kind of coaches us through this. Um, how do transit times, so trying to get to the main question here, do transit times influence the sensitivity to acid and nitrogen deposition? These graphs, um, on these graphs we've got, let's focus on the two on the right, because th that's mean transit time on the x-axis, and then we've got weathering products on the y-axis. We've got sodium concentrations in this graph, and then silica concentrations in this graph, and you can see that there's a positive correlation between transit time and those weathering products, indicating that those catchments have substantial buffering capacity. So acid deposition, the answer is yes. For nitrogen deposition, not so much. Um, there is not a strong correlation between um, nitrate concentrations, which I'm showing here, versus transit time metrics. Why is that? Well, first, let's note that there are some strong correlations between certain basin characteristics and the log of the nitrate in stream water. Mean air temperature has a um, negative influence on nitrate concentration. So when it's warm, nitrate in watersheds that have relatively warm mean annual temperatures, nitrate concentrations tend to be low. When you have a fair amount of nitrogen deposition, nitrate concentrations in stream water tend to be high. Makes sense. Steep basin slopes, you get high nitrate. A lot of barren terrain, you get high nitrate. If you have a lot of forest, you're gonna to tend to have low nitrate concentrations. Okay, what are the implications here? Transit times do influence acid buffering capacity. But other factors are more than other factors are more important than transit time for sensitivity to nitrogen deposition, air temperature and vegetation. Uh, soil and basin slope are all more important than transit time um, for basin sensitivity to nitrogen deposition. This, this was actually surprising to me, but maybe that's because I'm a geologist and I don't really, um, you know, you guys understand the vegetation stuff maybe a little bit better than I do. Why aren't transit times important for nitrogen? Remember, at least in my mind, biologic processes are rates. They're time dependent. I can I hypothesize that it's because transit times reflect, or at least the transit times that we calculated using the method that we used, reflect transport through deeper flow paths. And for nitrogen, most of the action is in the soil, which is a shallower flow path. In conclusion, sensitivity to nitrogen deposition varies spatially reflecting differences in basin characteristics and in climate. Nitrogen cycling processes operate on, in different places and at di on different timescales than those captured by our transit time metrics.
with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, time for a question. Jill. Yeah, I'm not, do, do you know if you use the same technique, the convolution integral? He's using a triple isotope assessment of nitrogen. Ah, okay, okay, right. Or maybe in just a block. Okay, well, um, it certainly, that, that makes sense. Um, I think in order to get at the shorter transit times like we're talking about, we need to use perhaps a different technique than what I used in my study, which can really only get at transit times at sl somewhat longer time scales. Thanks. Thank you. Um, our next speaker um, is Chris Clark from the EPA. Um, I really want to thank our federal scientists who are here because they need our support these days. Where's the pointer? Okay. All right. Hello, all. Thanks for coming to my talk today. Um, I won't reread the title. So today, a little bit of background. Um, atmospheric deposition of nitrogen and sulfur are far below uh, historic levels back in the 80s uh, and, and late 70s, they peaked. And we've come a long way, and that's a, that's a really positive story for public policy and in terms of improvement in environmental conditions. But what they still remain well above pre-industrial levels, exposing many ecological endpoints to potential risks. So what I'm showing here is just a map of the exceedances of the critical load for terrestrial acidification around the time of the peak in 1985 and more currently in 2015. And you can see there's a lot less red, there's a lot less deep red, but there's still quite a bit of area exposed to um, atmospheric deposition that's, that's too high. So I'm gonna give an overview of two uh, out of three sort of major uh, updates coming out of different research programs. Um, and kind of uh, sneak peek of the third that, that hopefully you'll be able to see uh, sometime in this conference. A national analysis, the first one of 94 tree species across the continental U.S., vulnerability to nitrogen and sulfur deposition that was published a few months ago uh, by Kevin Horn and colleagues. Uh, and then the second one on 343 herbaceous species of uh, vulnerability to nitrogen and sulfur deposition also across most of the conus. You'll see, you'll see what I mean by that um, when we get to that part of the talk. And then another one um, on even more species, 500 lichen species in five functional groups uh, by Linda Geyser at the Forest Service. So with, three, with these three uh, pieces of information, this is, this is um, a huge improvement in terms of our understanding of which species are vulnerable to nitrogen and sulfur deposition and where in the country. So the first one, National Assessment of Trees, the URL is down below if you can uh, find it, take a snapshot. I encourage you to go read that paper. I'm not going to go into too much detail in this talk, uh, but it's an assessment of the response of 94 tree species, two responses. Uh, the growth response and the survival response to nitrogen and sulfur deposition across the U.S. And it's based on a massive database of about 70 or 80,000 plots in the Forest Service Forest Inventory and uh, Assessment data set um, on over a million trees nationwide. So it was a huge undertaking, took about five years to get out, and finally came out a few months ago. So I definitely encourage you to check it out. Um, all of the individual curves are in the supplement, and a few of those I'll show you here as well as uh, a bunch of diagnostic information for decision makers to better understand um, how confident are we in this curve, how correlated is this variable with something else that might be driving this uh, pattern, um, because this is a space for time substitution, so it's a correlational analysis. Um, and hundreds of pages in the appendix that <laughs> obviously I won't go into. So here's one curve. There's almost 400 of these, so I'll just show you a few. Uh, this is the response of uh, longleaf pine 
um, to nitrogen deposition on the left is the mean growth rate in the solid curve and on the right is the probability of survival of a decade in the dashed line. Uh, underneath that is just a frequency distribution of trees of that species across the conus. So you can see just by scanning this, um, the analysis suggests that for this species there's a unimodal relationship with growth. It, it increases its growth until it reaches about uh, 12 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year and then there's a net negative effect. Um, we're looking into uh, some additional analyses to understand the mechanisms for that, but because this is a correlational analysis, it's difficult to tease out mechanism. And you can see that the probability of survival for this species appears unaffected by nitrogen. <clears throat> Here are the sulfur curves, same species, new driver. It's all in the same analysis. I can talk about that um, if there's a question or you can read uh, the paper. A uh, totally different relationship, negative relationship with um, sulfur on survival, no relationship on growth. So depending on where you live in the country, what species you care about, you can look these up and, and get an understanding of what is the sensitivity of these species to atmospheric deposition. So here's 25 species. Um, not expecting you to really digest any of this. The whole point is that there are lots of different curves, lots of different shapes. So there isn't this um, sort of central tendency that all species have the same response. It really depends on uh, your local neighborhood, soil characteristics, where you are in the country, uh, phenotypic plasticity. There's all kinds of um, reasons for this variation we're, that we're only starting to understand. So this is just um, the take home message. So the overview, lots of variation among species, even within the same genus. Um, what I'm showing here are just the nitrogen deposition uh, results for all of the species um, for growth on the left and survival on the right. These are all the species that had a positive monotonic relationship. There were 20 uh, for growth and survival. There were three. 17 species had a unimodal relationship um, with growth and 25 with survival and two showed a monotonic decreasing relationship um, with growth and six for survival. So take home messages here, more species increase than decrease with nitrogen deposition, but there's a lot of variation. And the most common response is for growth to actually increase, but survival to decrease. So what this is suggesting is that our forests, in North America at least, are probably being thinned out a little bit more than they would be otherwise, uh, but you're getting larger and fewer trees. So what does it mean for forests as a whole and carbon in particular? So here's the carbon maps um, in the top from this study and then a comparison of this study and an earlier one um, that I'll talk about really quickly. So you can see most of the areas are green. So on net, nitrogen deposition is having a positive effect on the amount of carbon in North American forests, but it's not true everywhere. Um, these are slopes of the relationship. So what this means is that an additional amount of nitrogen deposition is actually having a net uh, decreasing effect on forest carbon accumulation in the far northeast. Uh, comparing the 1980s and the 1990s, this is from Thomas et al. 2010 compared with this paper that just came out. And you can see that the temporal pattern has shifted dramatically too. There does appear to be a negative effect of long-term uh, exposure to high levels of nitrogen deposition such that 20 or 30 years ago, even though the rates were higher, they hadn't accumulated to a degree that have a net negative effect on the forest. And we're only seeing that today. So all of this suggests that with all of these different relationships at the species level, that there might be widespread but subtle changes in forest composition across the country. So what about herbs? This is, this is what's near and dear to my heart and Stu. Um, we love the herbs, so we've got to bring the herbs in. So what are herbs? Well, herbs occupy uh, many different habitat types. They're just non-woody, pretty species. Um, they're found in grasslands, forests, understories, alpine areas, uh, most ecosystems. Interesting tidbit, in forests even, most of the biodiversity is actually in the herb layer. So in terms of species richness and biodiversity, um, we should all care about herbs. That's my plug. Um, they're also really good canaries in the coal mine because like lichen, um, they're, they're responsive over policy-relevant timescales. These are, these are timescales that you can go out, 
and sample it five years later and actually see a result. It's, you can see it in the trees as well, but it's, it's just harder to sell to policymakers that you're having a 5% change in forest growth. So we were building on um, a study that came out uh, a couple years ago, um, published by Sam Simkin and a bunch of uh, colleagues that looked at the sensitivity of herbaceous total richness in grasslands um, nationwide from 15,000 uh, plots. So total richness is, in case you don't know, that's just the total number of species in a location. So what we found is that there were lots of places where the total numbers of species were increasing and places that where they were decreasing. And that inflection point or critical load was, uh, could vary quite a bit, but was, say, roughly 8 to 12 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. But inside of that signal, there are potentially lots of species that are increasing and decreasing everywhere that add up to that total effect. So this is our follow-on question is, well, okay, you know, so total richness actually declines above about 8 to 12 kilograms, but what happens at the individual species level? How many species? Or is it just the same species that you're losing everywhere, or does it vary quite a bit across the landscape? So I won't, again, go into the analysis. This is under review right now, um, but we hope to uh, get it published in the next two or three months. Um, but uh, some, some statistical analysis that I can talk about after the talk if you're interested. Um, these are the spaghetti diagrams of the 243 species that we feel like we had really robust results for. And you can see, as with the trees, there's a lot of variation from species to species in terms of its um, sensitivity to nitrogen deposition. So what you see here is about 15% or 30 species that showed no benefit and just a net decrease with additional nitrogen deposition. These are probably poor competitors, more native species. Uh, then over half, 54% or 107, showed some unimodal relationship. And the location of that peak could vary quite a bit from relatively low to moderate to high. And at the other end of that spectrum, uh, there were 20% of species or 40 that uh, didn't show any evidence of a decline over quite a wide range. So these are sort of our weedier species that generally win um, at higher levels of, of nitrogen deposition. And interestingly, if you average it over all of those species, the average critical load is sort of uh, reproduces what we find in the species richness paper, the first one. And in anecdotal papers back in the 90s and 80s, a lot of the ecologists were like, well, you know, we're not really sure how sensitive these ecosystems are, but it seems like at around 10, you get some negative effect. So if you look at these old papers, these um, earlier ecologists were really prescient in being able to predict sensitivity. So here's some of the sulfur curves. 57 percent, uh, 137 species showed a negative relationship and 40 showed a benefit. We don't think those are actually responding to any sort of nutrient limitation. These are probably just acid tolerant species that benefit from the loss of neighbors. So the take home message uh, for the trees and herbs, about 70% of herb species and 73% of trees were negatively affected by nitrogen and or sulfur somewhere across the US. At most sites, more species benefited than are harmed by nitrogen deposition. This was pretty consistent in the trees and the herbs. But that nearly everywhere, there were some sensitive species. There were, there were some or a handful of species being lost everywhere. Um, and they, we did um, some supplementary analysis. The species that were lost tended to be species that were more native and even of higher conservation value. <clears throat> Sulfur deposition remains a threat, but much less so in the past. And all of this suggests that pretty um, subtle but potentially widespread compositional changes in our, nat in our natural ecosystems. So with that, I'll take any questions. Yeah. So it depends on the study. In the trees, it's not accounted for. There are supplemental analyses that we want to add to add things like um, soil pH, uh, base saturation, to see if you know, the nitrogen signal maybe disappears when you add some of these additional factors. 
Those types of predictors aren't available at the P2 or P1 scale for the FIA data set. So you have to go into the finer scale data, the P3, and that was uh, terminated in 2011. So a lot of those plots, we just don't have that information. But there are follow-on analyses that we're trying to do with that. With the herbs, uh, soil pH is included. And so the, and the correlation between pH and all of the other factors is also included. And we have these uh, variance inflation factor, which sort of uh, gives you a diagnostic of how confident should you be in this nitrogen signal for all of the species. So it's difficult to account for specifically in a correlation analysis like this, but we've included it where we can. Yep. Okay. One more? Uh, I think that. I got nine seconds. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, I think it, I mean, we don't know, but I think it'll probably make ecosystems a little bit more sensitive because it tends to be stickier in the system and potentially have a bigger effect per molecule of nitrogen. Yep. Yep. Okay, uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, now we're going to go to New Zealand. Uh, Troy Bateson's going to talk about uh, nitrogen science and a nitrogen cap reduction in a New Zealand lake. Kia ora, which is the national greeting of New Zealand. Okay. Great. So, again, I'm talking about a rather ponderous title, but as you can imagine, trying to get a capping scheme, which turns into, of course, a cap and trade scheme, is a ponderous problem. I'm going to acknowledge my co authors first. Um, this talk, I'll explain a bit, bit, little bit more about how this talk is set up. They've contributed to a five-year review, and I've pulled some pieces out of that review. Um, so Chris McBride, in particular, has looked at the longest-term loads into the lake. James Dare has looked at trends uh, since two th the year 2000, and Matt Allen actually contributed uh, a lot of work to something I'm not going to talk about for reasons that I'm going to explain. Um, I'm go also going to thank uh, my funders. I've recently picked up uh, the Bay of Plenty Regional Council Chair in Lake and Freshwater Scientists, which is quite a job for a soil scientist to pick up. And um, that's essentially what I'm doing. And the job here is to bring work in the catchment um, to the catchment scale and focus on agriculture and reductions in the landscape, as well as what goes on in the water. Um, we have a National Lakes program, which is contributing to this, and um, I also have a Tracers program, which is contributing to this work. I'd also just briefly like to acknowledge the Center of Research Excellence, Te Punaha Matatini, which means the meeting place of many faces. And um, that's essentially a New Zealand Center of Research Excellence on complexity, which is a good thing, uh, acknowledging Stu's remark earlier about the complexity of the nitrogen cycle. So this is the catchment, and I'll, I'll show more about that in a moment. Let's just talk about nitrogen capping in New Zealand. There are two catchments that are widely known to have a cap and trade schemes uh, set, being set up or set up in lakes. I talked on the sort of the 12th anniversary of the session, I believe it was, about the five-year anniversary of primarily the Lake Topol um, cap and trade scheme. I'm not going to talk too much more about that today. It's a 20% reduction. Um, relative to um, 2005 levels. In Rotorua, a cap went on that represents levels sort of in the 2001 to 2005 period. The reductions are under appeal. The goal is to maintain the lake's trophic state, and I'll just talk slightly more about what we mean by that in another few slides, um, at roughly where it was in the 1960s. And so what we're trying to do is reduce the nitrogen load by 2032 from 755 tons of nitrogen reaching the lake to 435 tons. Now, we've had a five-year science review process that's just uh, completed. And the, my talk's changed a little bit because the report from the five-year science review hasn't been tabled at the, the regional government, the council, yet. So I'm not going to talk too much about it ex except for the introductory material there. I'm not really hiding anything either. There's plenty to talk about. Um, what I'm going to focus on is I now pick up leadership of the science in this area. 
So what I want to talk about is where do we need to go in the next five years to actually meet these nutrient reduction targets? So we have a first reduction target at 2022, and then a further reduction target by 2032. Uh, and finally, just the, the map on the left, we have a lakes portal for New Zealand, um, which uh, you can find out more about at our website, learns.co.nz. Um, lake Rotorua is a shallow um, polymictic lake, which means that it, uh, it's not so deep that it mixes multiple times during the year rather than just once. Um, you can see there is kind of a deep rift running through the middle of the lake, but the bathymetry on the left shows that most of the lake is shallower than 10 to 12 meters, and there's a large littoral zone around the edges of the lake. Um, we had rather bad algal blooms up until about 2010. Um, this shows one of them, and this is actually on our lakes portal, um, which runs as a web interface, and so you can actually breeze back and forth through images of satellite um, uh, estimated chlorophyll that Matt Allen actually put together, one of the authors on the talk. Um, so what we um, see here in 2010 is a significant algal bloom, a cyanobacterial bloom, and of course cyanobacteria contribute uh, nitrogen to the lake in many instances as well. Now those blooms have actually been stopped by alum dosing the lake, and that's a significant effort because this is a 10 kilometer length lake, 80 kilometers squared, um, and so it's not very much alum, and, and doesn't really reach levels of alum tox aluminum toxicity, but it is a, um, a significant effort and it's the largest effort at this scale. It works remarkably well in this lake, um, not so well in some other lakes. So the, this, these are some images from a recent photo contest run by the district council, which give a good image of what we have going on there. You have a lovely landscape and a lake that has fairly good quality most of the time. Um, it's a tourist mecca for New Zealand, and that's one of the reasons we're so interested in looking after it. And it's also the heart of Maori culture. So you see people here actually doing things and interacting with the landscape in the ways that um, they want to, and the Te Arawa people are really trying to come back to being involved and living in the landscape. And the treaty settlements that have come out of um, legislation in New Zealand actually give the, the lake bed back to the native people, the Te Arawa. So this is the overall catchment of the Rotorua Te Arawa lakes. Um, there are about 12 lakes um, within the Bay of Plenty region. Um, and uh, so you can see there's quite a bit more there than Lake Rotorua. I won't talk too much about um, the additional lakes today, except to say that Lake Rotorua does flow out through Lake Rotuiti and then through the river, which is shown at the top of the screen. Um, and so the, the water quality in Lake Rotorua also affects those other areas. And they actually had built a wall prior to 2010 to keep the bad water from Lake Rotorua from making Lake Rotuiti worse. That seems to no longer be needed, so we won't talk about it further. Um, you can see there the main land uses are forest and pasture. And you can also see a, get a sense of the urban zone. If we look at a land use map, I've uh, sort of colored this in a sense as a land use spectrum. And so the bright things are the things that you should possibly worry about. Uh, primarily dairy farming and sheep and beef farming are the areas of New Zealand where we have a lot of nitrogen going into the landscape. Now that mainly occurs through clover fixing nitrogen, um, but there is urea also added, particularly under dairy farming. Uh, production forestry is the, the uh, darker green, and then we move into scrub and native forests in uh, additional colors there. And the bright white is the urban part of the landscape. We also have geothermal areas within the catchment, including within the urban area itself, which adds to excitement. A recent geothermal congress that was held there commented that it was a bit like having a city inside of Yellowstone. This gives a sense of the physiography and the different subcatchments. And one of the first things that you might see is that the uh, density of the stream network is quite variable across um, the catchment and in the northwest and northern corners there's very, relatively few streams. And that turns out to be sort of interesting and important because there's been a major focus on groundwater as something that needs to be understood in terms of how nitrogen flows into the lake and when nitrogen flows into the lake. I'm going to focus on the uppermost catchment there, the, the Homerana catchment. 
And the surface water catchment isn't really much of a catchment, it's just an area that's demarcated in terms of flowing into the lake. You can see the springs there is a very small uh, spring. If we look at the groundwater catchment, so you can see that the groundwater catchment for the spring is believed to cover a much larger area. And you can think of this essentially as a tephra and ignimbrite layer having been deposited over a former landscape. Um, so perhaps that's what happened. It, it certainly makes sense anyway. And it essentially has a groundwater catchment that then crosses two surface water catchments and is quite a bit bigger than you would expect. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about that, and the main point here is to understand the complexity of how we should think about groundwater or other complex factors when we try to design nitrogen capping schemes and try to make them work for people. The key issue mm -hmm. here is when we think about the large amount of farming in the catchment, we need to understand how we can reduce uh, losses of nitrogen from farming by actually getting land managers to do something. So when we think about that in the context of the overall view of what's happened in the catchment over time. Here you can see the red line, the red dashed line represents the cap that we're trying to get to. There's also a target for total phosphorus. Um, the first thing you'll see is uh, brown bars creeping up into the 1990s, and that was the point at which wastewater treatment in uh, the, the early 1990s was diverted out of the lake and onto land, and that made a big difference. The effect of it going onto land is now shown in light green bars. So you can see that that helped enormously. So we solved the problem once. The problem is agricultural cont intensity continued to increase. So we need to solve the problem again. And that's what the cap reduction is intended to do. I said I'd mention more about trophic level index. So this is commonly used to some degree around the world. In New Zealand, and particularly our lakes, it's, it's proved to be very useful. It's a combined logarithmic index of uh, chlorophyll A, secchi depth, total nitrogen, and total phosphorus. Um, and so that essentially the, the, edit, the, the, the combination of those components adds up to the black dot. And you can see that it improved dramatically in 2010 um, and got back to close to the levels that we believe that it was at in the 1960s, if you can extrapolate a little further back from the uh, 1970s era. And so essentially the lake quality is now controlled by alum, but we don't want to continue doing that. We'd like to actually get this sorted out with land use. Um, and getting a permanent and uh, sensible uh, nitrogen and phosphorus scheme. Now, lakes in the central North Island, I will say, are sort of considered nitrogen limited, but in reality, um, there is a dual limitation. Um, and the natural sort of health of the lake, in some ways, may be me measured by the retention of the lake, that is to say, what fraction of nitrogen or phosphorus is retained within the lake. Um, and you can see here the alum dosing has to some degree restored that retention index back towards where it was in the past. And it's a surprising, it's not surprising at all that it uh, achieved a high retention of phosphorus, but it's also quite interesting that it retained a high retention of nitrogen. One possible reason for that, of course, is a reduction in cyanobacterial end fixation. It would show up in the index. Now moving along to the groundwater flows, um, this is a plot typically shown for uh, around New Zealand for how we need to worry about how much groundwater is going to influence policy in the future. And this is the type of information that went into it. Now this paper um, raised a lot of concerns by freshwater ecologists about these, um, this area because of several factors. The main one was arguing that we actually shouldn't control phosphorus at all. Um, there was a major response to that I won't talk about that was published in the same journal later on. Um, the key issue here is the um, water dating information that leads to that sort of a plot that suggests that it's very hard to actually clean up old water and it's just going to keep flowing into the lake over time. Now, interestingly, this paper was a combination of a whole bunch of um, earlier reports. And they started out with a simple tritium data set that was broken up into a single um, mean resonance time and exponential flow model. Then it was broken up into two of them because there was a longer tritium time series and that was what was required to fit it. And so you can see Hammer on a spring there and just keep a note that's broken up into two pieces with, a fair, with 185 and 12 year mean resonance times and I'll talk just a bit more about that. Now if I just breeze through some water quality trends here, I mentioned I would do that. We can see nitrogen actually is not going up in the Hammer on a area with that old groundwater. Interestingly though, phosphorus is and that's 
particularly surprising because Morgenstern et al. noted that phosphorus was not elevated in young groundwater and is purely due to geological factors. So phosphorus was actually expected to be stable, yet it's the one that's increasing. And again, here's a different way of looking at the same thing, looking at loads, um, two different estimates. And if we just look at concentrations, including a much earlier data set, we see something similar. Picture gets slightly more complicated because it hasn't, um, you know, it's just a data cloud essentially. Um, but certainly we don't see that, ma that massive increase in recent years um, that you might expect to continue to see based on the water ages. So if we just do a thought experiment, let's end with that about how we can reduce this complexity and look forward to the future. So I mentioned there were two, two um, d distributions of water ages. So if we plot them, here they are. And you can see that actually there's quite a bit of young water. Now if we just put that young water through a 55 year pulse and then look at what happens in time as that comes out, we see this and it imp implies to me, so if that was say one ppm of nitrate into an area of, of zero ppm of nitrate, it looks like we can start cleaning that up and we got to about 40% of the permanent level that we would have gotten to eventually. So in a sense, Morgan Stern aren't wrong, but there is some confusion there that we need to better understand. And what that means is that if we're entering a period where reductions are required and policy is set, land managers will need to understand what actions can be taken. Um, if those groundwater lag times are inconsistent or confusing, um, then we need to think carefully about the simplifications that are used and we can think about more dating tools, particularly the different ways of getting to a young fraction like we saw two talks ago with water, water isotopes. Also testing whether we can use radiocarbon as an alternate tool. It may give us a slightly different answer in dissolved inorganic carbon. And uh, I'm a bit worried also that we have an exchangeable hydrogen problem with tritium dating and if anybody's looked at that, I'd be quite interested to know because it's something we worry about quite a bit with stable isotopes. Thank you very much. Oh. Yeah. Good catch. Uh, thanks. It's uh, good to see the, the groundwater stuff coming through here. Um, so our next talk is by Rohit Matur, uh, characterizing the long-term trends in atmospheric nitrogen deposition across the whole northern hemisphere. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my co-authors, Yu Chan Zhang, uh, Christian Hargreff, uh, Jia Xing, who, who did a lot of the heavy lifting in, in terms of uh, the simulations I'm going to show you, and Homera Sharif. So as atmospheric modelers, uh, we really are interested in, in being able to accurately quantify the sinks uh, of, of, uh, of a variety of atmospheric pollutants, primarily to be able to describe their atmospheric budgets. So uh, as, as you all know, wet, wet deposition, wet scavenging, and dry deposition are the two primary sinks that remove pollutants from the atmosphere. And as we've seen in many of the talks earlier today, uh, this deposition leads to a variety of environmental effects. So we are also interested in being able to understand those. Uh, from an atmospheric standpoint, uh, we're also interested in being able to quantify deposition amounts in these models correctly simply because there's some interesting connections with, with the physics and chemistry of, of uh, air pollution. So for example, gas particle partitioning of uh, airborne nitrogen and, and sulfur species uh, regulates transport distances of these pollutants simply because uh, the rates of removal are very different depending on, uh, on what form they exist in the atmosphere. So, so nitric acid, ammonia deposit very rapidly through dry deposition, whereas if they're converted into particles, they tend to get transported a, a lot uh, further simply because the only way to remove them then is, is through uh, scavenging and, and rain out. So the question that we were interested in was uh, how are changing emission patterns across, across the globe impacting deposition patterns and, and what that means? So uh, just to orient you to, to the calculations, what I'm going to show you uh, today are calculations over the Northern Hemisphere. So that's North America over here, Africa, 
Europe, uh, India, and, and then China around here. And what I'm showing you over here are estimates that we've used of emissions from the Edgar Global Inventory. Um, I apologize for the quality of, of this plot, but what is shown on the top is, is NOx and bottom ammonia. And what you see is that contrasting changes in, in uh, emissions have occurred across the Northern Hemisphere, primarily resulting from the implementation of policies in, in North America and Europe, which have reduced emissions of NOx quite significantly over this 21-year time period. Uh, whereas in contrast, uh, in, in North America at least, we've seen uh, increase in ammonia emissions as well as in Asia. So I'll show you some results also from uh, calculations over uh, a nested domain over North America where we've used finer resolution and a slightly uh, more uh, updated version of, of these emission inventories and their trends. Okay, so after pouring through terabytes and terabytes of data uh, from these calculations, uh, the first thing we are interested in looking at is how well do we stack up relative to the measurements. So shown here are wet deposition estimates from the model on, on, on the y-axis relative to uh, uh, observations uh, from the NADP network, so sulfate on the left, uh, nitrates in the middle, and then ammonia on the right. Uh, the green dots essentially are, are uh, uh, locations uh, in, in the eastern U.S. The red dots are locations in the western U.S. using about 100 degrees as sort of the nominal way to segregate that. Uh, but what we see is that uh, the, when, when we just look at sort of the snapshot of all the data, uh, the model does exhibit some skill in picking up the spatial and temporal variability in these deposition amounts. We do see uh, some underestimation in, in deposition for ammonium and then uh, also for nitrate, and, and that uh, I think primarily stems from uh, uncertainties in our estimates of ammonia emissions. We can then take that data and also translate it into a slightly different form where we can look at trends. So we, over there, I just thrown all the data in one plot. Uh, now we are looking at trends at each location. And what you see is that uh, as a result of reductions in SO2 emissions, we've, we've reduced uh, sulfate deposition amounts quite significantly across, uh, across the US uh, as a result of reductions in uh, NOx emissions, we've reduced uh, deposition of nitrate, but then when we look at ammonium deposition amounts, we see both increases and decreases uh, across, across the U.S. And so as, as we saw in previous uh, talks, ammonia emissions in the U.S. have increased, and, and you see uh, uh, that signal over here. Now just quickly, I'd, I'd mentioned that we'd also done some finer scale simulations, uh, and if we look at similar trends from from those finer scale simulations with slightly updated uh, versions of, of the emissions, uh, we are able to essentially represent uh, this correlation a little better than with, with the 108 kilometer simulation. Uh, we can also look at the same uh, similar data uh, for uh, against observations in Europe. So this is the EMEP measurements. Uh, what you see over here is that uh, Relative to, uh, relative to EMEP, uh, we tend to uh, systematically underestimate deposition amounts for all the species. And uh, this is not uh, something unique just to our model. Um, I've, I've talked to a number of colleagues who, who do modeling in Europe and they see similar things. Uh, talking to colleagues uh, in, in, in the UK, at least in the UK, a lot, a lot of the measurements are representing bulk samples. So. Uh, here we're just looking at, at the model wet deposition amounts where the bulk samples conceivably have both uh, wet and dry. So that might account for some part of the bias. Uh, if we correct for precipitation biases, we are able to uh, remove some of that low bias but not eliminate it. So, so that's still kind of uh, something that we're trying to understand a little more. Okay, so now getting into trends, uh, and I'll show you a number of plots uh, of, of this kind, so let me just take a minute to orient you. Uh, so here's North America, Europe in, in the middle, and then Asia. And these are deposition amounts for total inorganic nitrogen, which is uh, both the reduced and the oxidized forms. Uh, and so these are maps uh, from our simulation results for 1990. 
And then these at the bottom are the corresponding trends that we are entering from these 21 year continuous simulations starting in 1990 through 2010. So not surprisingly, what, what you see is that when we look at Asia, we see some pretty significant increases uh, in nitrogen deposition across large parts of Asia, um, in India, in, in China. Um, in, in Europe, we see pretty significant reductions, uh, whereas when we look at, at, at the US, we are seeing both reductions as well as increases. Uh, and the reason that happens is because uh, because, in, because of, of differing uh, trends in, in reduced and oxidized nitrogen emissions. Now we can then break that total nitrogen uh, deposition into its oxidized and reduced forms. So uh, in, in Asia, we see reductions both in, uh, both in the oxidized nitrogen deposition as well as the reduced nitrogen deposition. In, uh, in Europe, we, we uh, I apologize, we see in, increases in, in deposition of both oxidized and reduced in, in Asia. Uh, in contrast, we see reductions uh, in, in both those components uh, in, um, in Europe. But when we look at deposition trends in, in, uh, across the U.S., what we see is we see some pretty significant reductions in uh, deposition amounts for, for oxidized nitrogen, but then uh, in contrast, we see increases in reduced nitrogen deposition. We can also, uh, from the model, try and infer what are the relative contributions of wet and dry deposition. So here are uh, the wet and dry deposition amounts, uh, as well as the total deposition for oxidized nitrogen. And what we see is that both the wet and, and the dry deposited amounts of oxidized uh, nitrogen have, have come down. Uh, when we look at similar uh, trends in, in the reduced nitrogen component, uh, what we see is that uh, uh, the reduced nitrogen deposition has increased quite significantly in, in this 21-year time period, and that is driven predominantly by increases in dry deposition. So what appears to be happening is that as we've reduced uh, SO2 and NOx emissions, uh, we have essentially reduced the amount of, and, and as ammonia emissions have increased, the relative amount of NHx getting partitioned into the particle phase has, has come down. Uh, so as a result, a lot of the ammonia tends to deposit more locally. So that's why we are seeing this increase in dry deposition amounts of ammonia. Now, we are also interested in, in trying to infer what the impacts of, of these changes in deposition uh, imply for uh, uh, ecosystem effects, uh, so shown uh, on this plot on the left is uh, the trends in, in, in the total acid load shown here in, in uh, units of equivalence for sulfur and nitrogen deposition. And not surprisingly, uh, the, what we, based on the plot that we've seen earlier, we see these large reductions in, in the total acid load deposit, uh, deposition in uh, across the eastern U.S., uh, western Europe, and in contrast, we see these increases in, in India and uh, across China. Now, if you just use uh, a threshold of, of 10 kilograms nitrogen per hectare per year as, as an indicator of, of a critical load, uh, then we can look at what, uh, how, uh, how the deposition trends have changed relative to the 1990 value. So what, what we see are these significant increases in, in um, terrestrial areas uh, in China that are now seeing uh, much higher deposition amounts, whereas in contrast, in, in both in Europe and in North America, we see these pretty significant reductions. Uh, Chris showed uh, uh, this plot earlier. So we, we are now looking at, at uh, uh, changes in critical load relative to these measurements. Uh, uh, reported in Simkin et al. So this is uh, the critical load map. So in, in red uh, are regions where the critical load uh, was exceeded in 1990. In blue uh, are regions where uh, it, it, it was, the deposition was less than the critical load. And here's a similar map for, for 2010. And, and what you see is that there have been some significant reductions uh, in the number of sites uh, 
exceeding the nitrogen critical load, uh, about a 31%. Uh, uh, the 31% of the sites in, in 1990 uh, were estimated to uh, exceed the critical load, whereas in 2010 it's about 9%. So, so reductions in, in NOx and SO2 emissions, which were directed at improving air quality, have also helped uh, with, with improving uh, uh, ecological impacts. And finally, uh, some very preliminary results where we've, we've tried to look at, is there an association between uh, these changes in nitrogen deposition uh, and, uh, and, and chlorophyll in, 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 uh, in the open ocean? So, so we are using the chlorophyll uh, data from the Modis Aqua. And what I'm showing here is uh, uh, over, over this 2003 to 2010 period for different uh, regions, so, uh, so the Indian Ocean, uh, the outflow from, from China, outflow from North America, uh, and then the North Atlantic region, where we are, we've tried to correlate uh, the anomaly in, in nitrogen deposition with the anomaly in ocean chlorophyll. And indeed, there is a weak relationship. Uh, it's not perfect, but there does appear to be some relationship between changes in nitrogen deposition and changes in ocean chlorophyll concentrations. So I am out of time. Uh, I'll leave that summary up. And uh, if there's time, I'd be happy to answer questions. Yeah, I think we have time for a quick question. Yeah, we have one question. Got to be. I'm not sure I fully uh, heard your question. So you said large reductions in Europe. So I mean, I, I, it, it primarily is responding to emissions. So uh, you know, the question is, are, are the emission trends uh, in, in that part of, of the world represented correctly or not? Okay. Uh, Time to move on. We're going to do a little scale whiplash here from the whole northern hemisphere to conifer needles. Uh, Laura Coopers is going to talk about nitrogen fixation in foliar microbial communities and conifers. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yes, and we're also going to switch gears from talking about um, nitrogen deposition to talking about uh, nitrogen fixation in ecosystems that are uh, by and large limited uh, by, by nitrogen availability. Um, so first I just wanted to acknowledge uh, some critical folks on this project. Diane Quiroz, who is a graduate student at UC Berkeley working with me. Diana Carper, who recently uh, defended her PhD at UC Merced um, and has been working with my collaborator, collaborator on this project, Caroline Frank. So nitrogen, oops, oh, I'm using the wrong one. <laughs> Thank you. So nitrogen limitation uh, is widespread in mature boreal and temperate forest ecosystems. Uh, and nitrogen nodulating symbioses are not a large fraction of the, um, the plant communities in these forests. So nodulating symbioses are, are typically rare in the mature uh, forests. Uh, and primarily are seen in early successional stages of forest development when light availability and energy availability is high. So the sources of nitrogen to balance and losses from these mature systems are not widely uh, understood. And there have been a number of proposals in recent uh, years for how these losses might be balanced, for example, through nitrogen fixation in, uh, by cyanobacteria living in mosses where there are peat, uh, mosses in boreal forests, for example. Also, nitrogen from uh, organic matter uh, in sedimentary rocks has been identified as a potential source. Um, but still, um, these peat uh, mosses and sedimentary rocks are not everywhere where these forests occur. So we still have um, really um, a, not a complete understanding of how nitrogen comes into these systems. My collaborator, Caroline, and her students became interested really in the bacterial endophytic communities. So by uh, endophytes, uh, what I mean is the bacteria that are living in healthy uh, tissues of plants, so they're not pathogenic in any way, 
Um, and in uh, her exploration of these uh, bacterial communities, uh, we found in subalpine forests in Colorado that a large fraction of the community was acetic acid bacteria. So something like 6 to 62 percent of the bacteria found in these tissues uh, were in this group. It's a phylogenetically diverse group, but of the uh, top 10 taxa found, uh, a number of them were closely related to known nitrogen fixers uh, that were found in other, um, other plants, including as nitrogen fixers in sugarcane. Uh, and so this led us to wonder, perhaps this is a new pathway for nitrogen to enter these mature conifer ecosystems. Uh, and in particular, the data I'm showing here is from a study, um, studies we, a study we did in limber pine, which is a high elevation conifer uh, that's widespread throughout the western U.S. Um, and uh, we, okay, so we have this hypothesis, like maybe there's some nitrogen fixation going on. So we set out to measure this, um, and in a paper we published in 2016, we showed that indeed there is nitrogen uh, fixation occurring, and we measured this by looking at the activity of the nitrogenase enzyme, which is the enzyme needed to um, uh, convert the N2 gas in the atmosphere into a usable form, an ammonium, uh, that is used by the bacteria and can be used by plants. Uh, and so we found positive rates of N fixation using this assay, um, but they were very low, about uh, 0.2 nanomoles of ethylene uh, converted per, grams of needle, uh, per gram of needle tissue per hour. Uh, we also measured the end pools in the soil in the, in the locations where we looked at this and didn't find a strong relationship. Uh, one might, might have expected that where nitrogen in the soil is low, that uh, the nitrogen fixation rates in the tissues would be higher to compensate, but we didn't see strong evidence for this. Uh, but we hadn't set out to answer that question, so um, in this study, uh, what we wanted to do was ask, is this potential for foliar endophytic nitrogen fixation widespread, or is it something that's just particular to limber pine in Colorado? Um, and we were interested also in understanding whether these rates might differ between the host tree species. Uh, we were interested to know whether the bacterial communities and the foliage of other pines were similar to those in Colorado. And we wanted to know then whether fixation potential in bacterial communities varied systematically with soil fertility. And we set up our experimental design explicitly to test that. So the study site that we used is um, this ecological staircase in, in coastal California where the uh, soil age varies uh, quite significantly and along with it the fertility of the soil. So the oldest um, wave cut terrace in the upper uh, part of the staircase has very low uh, fertility whereas the lowest and youngest soils uh, have um, higher fertility. So there are two species that grow along this gradient, uh, bishop pine, Pinus muricata, and um, two variants of uh, Pinus contorta, which are known as bolander pine and shore pine. So they both occur um, along this age gradient. So we could look at the species contrast as well. So just some data from um, prior studies that looked at soil fertility in particular that show uh, total soil nitrogen decreasing uh, with soil age. So the youngest terrace is terrace one, the oldest here is terrace five, and you can see uh, a reduction by about half in total soil nitrogen and in total organic phosphorus in the soils. Uh, foliar phosphorus also declines with terrace age, but foliar nitrogen does not. So this was, you know, we were thinking maybe an indicator that uh, some other mechanisms for nitrogen coming into the system might be important. So again, we use this uh, acetylene reduction assay to test for nitrogenase activity, um, where we add um, a 10% uh, acetylene to samples of uh, foliage that we've taken from the field. So we pulled twig samples from three of these terraces along the full age gradient and from both tree species at actually more than two time points. We did three time points. Uh, and then we surf surface sterilized the samples to be able to just look at what the endophytic um, bacteria might be doing. Then we also had uh, sequenced, the, we also sequenced the DNA, uh, the 16S gene from uh, paired samples that we took. 
So uh, we were able then in this study to confirm that indeed um, bacteria in, these, in this conifer foliage is fixing nitrogen. So we found nitrogenase activity in these California pines in addition to what we had seen in Colorado. And the rates that we found were about one nanomole of ethylene per gram of needle tissue per hour, which is about five times the rate we saw in Colorado. We saw evidence for differences between the host species. So we saw higher rates of fixation in the bishop pine as compared to the pinus contorta along this age gradient. Um, but we didn't see any um, clear differences among terrace ages or no clear differences in fixation rates with soil fertility, counter to our expectation. The endophyte communities along this staircase However, we're very similar to what we're, we're, we're very simi similar to what we saw in Colorado. So this acetic acid bacterial group, um, which is shown in the um, the light green here, is the do again the dominant um, bacterial group that was found in these samples. About 38 to 68 percent of the sequences were from this group. We also found um, other groups. Um, that were uh, in the acido, beta proteo, and gamma proteo bacteria. And some of these taxa have um, members within them. For example, um, I'm not going to try and pronounce the name of this group, <laughs> the, the Colobacteriaceae um, and the Burkholderia, um, Burkholder, Burkholder, okay, I'm not going to try and pronounce that one either. Um, which are in these sort of teal colors, uh, have, mem have taxa within them that can also fix nitrogen. So we don't know exactly which bacterial taxa are, are doing the nitrogen fixation, um, but we've been sort of focused on these Acetobacteriaceae because they are the, the most dominant ones in, in, the, in the foliage. Um, but just to put a little bit of finer point on it, many of the top 100 variants that we found in these sequences are between 97 and 100 percent similar to the Colorado taxa. So there's a lot of consistency in the bacterial communities across these sites. Um, this is just an ordination showing the bacterial communities as a whole. Um, unlike with the nitrogen fixation, we did see strong evidence for um, the, the bacterial communities to differ among the terraces. So there's some influence of the soil fertility on the bacterial communities, but not on the nitrogen fixation rates. Um, the host species also um, helped structure the bacterial communities that we saw, and we saw some differences between uh, sampling dates. So in addition to using this acetylene reduction assay, we wanted to use um, a direct measure of nitrogen fixation um, by incubating um, samples with 15N. But we have this challenge that, uh, first of all, these are living tissues, so just putting um, sort of a, a clump, like you can put a clump of soil or other organic matter into a closed vial. Here we have a challenge of needing to keep these plant tissues alive and happy um, over an extended period of time to accumulate enough 15N to be able to detect that 15N in samples. So basically, we had to use a, um, a chamber uh, for a period of about 20 days where we kept seedlings that were rooted in, um, in sterile soil um, alive and happy uh, for this extended period of time. So this is a picture of Diane and this glove box uh, that we um, used for this purpose. And we incubated these um, seedlings that we'd taken from the field uh, with 15N2, about uh, 11 atom percent 15N2 at the start of the experiment, but due to leaks, it, it got down to about two by the end. In any case, and then we measured the 15N uh, using isotope ratio mass spectrometry. So um, consistent with the nitrogenase, um, assay, we found that 15N did accumulate in the seedling foliage over time. Uh, you can see here this is the, the start of the experiment, and then this is at the end of the experiment. Uh, we didn't see any clear difference between host species in this, in this study, um, but when we uh, deconstructed the experiment at the end, we found that uh, while there was 15N accumulating in the, in the foliage, there was uh, even more 15N accumulating in the roots. Um, and so we don't know whether the roots were strong um, sinks for the fixed nitrogen or if there was fixation happening in association with the roots. Um, and it's 
likely that there was rhizosphere fixation um, contributing here. Oh, and I should say that we estimate um, about 0.04 milligrams of nitrogen was it on average accumulated in the tissues, and this corresponds to about seven micrograms of nitrogen fixed over the period of, of the incubation, about 20 days. Um, another thing that we discovered here was that uh, the new needles were accumulating more of this label than older needles. Uh, the trees retained their needles for a couple of years. Um, and so again, we don't know if there were more bacteria in these new needles or if these were um, active sites of growth and therefore uh, accumulating um, nitrogen fixed elsewhere in the plant. So just to conclude, uh, we did find that uh, nitrogen fixation could be a more widespread new pathway for N inputs into mature conifer forests, um, that this is occurring in the foliage, but again, also that root and rhizosphere N fixation is potentially important. Rates in California, we found, um, were about five times the rates in, in Colorado. Um, and there is some evidence for host species differences, uh, but we didn't find support for this fertility, any fertility effect, soil fertility effect. And then again, that the endophytic communities are dominated by the same microbes in both California and in Colorado, um, and that this appears to be affected by the site fertility as well as the host species. So thank you. I think we can pull off a quick question. I'll ask one. Okay. So it seemed like the nitrogen use efficiency of endophytic fixation would be really high. So um, any thoughts on like what its real contribution is to the nitrogen balance of the forest? So we um, tried to do that calculation for the limber pine study. Um, and what we determined was that it was potentially, you know, small on an annual basis, but potentially important over a longer period of time. We haven't tried to do that for this California site yet, but it's on our list. Okay, yeah, yeah the thanks. limber pines can live 1,000 years. Exactly, so, yeah. yeah. Okay, Thank thanks. Okay, our final talk of uh, stage one nitrogen saturation here is uh, by Benton Taylor. This is an invited talk, and we're gonna go down to the tropics here, and another nitrogen fixation talk. Thanks everyone for being here, and thanks to the conveners. This has been a really wonderful session so far. So, I'm going to talk to you about symbiotic nitrogen fixation, and just to be clear, I'm actually talking about nodulating symbioses uh, in contrast to the last talk. Uh, and I'm going to present some evidence that I think, as a field, it's really time for us to look beyond soil nitrogen as the primary regulator of infixation in terrestrial ecosystems. So given the focus of this session, um, I'm not going to belabor this point too much, but just to remind everyone, nitrogen fixation is the main pathway to convert nitrous or nitrogen gas into reactive forms down here in the biosphere, and symbiotic infixation has the highest potential rates for this process. So the importance of this process has effectively led lots of researchers to ask some version of the question, what controls inputs of reactive nitrogen into the biosphere via symbiotic infixation? And if you're a nitrogen fixing plant, you've got sort of two options to meet your nitrogen demand. You can either fix it from the atmosphere or you can take it up directly from the soil. And it's this dichotomy that I think leads us to the assumption that underlies much of end fixation research. And that assumption, I think, is really beautifully outlined by Vitusik and Howarth here in their 91 paper. Right here in the first sentence of their abstract, they say, it would seem that nitrogen fixers should have a substantial competitive advantage whenever nitrogen is limiting and that their activity in turn should reverse nitrogen limitation. So here they're saying that end fixation should be highest when soil nitrogen is scarce and then it should be down regulated as nitrogen progressively builds up in a system. And this makes perfect intuitive sense, right? If you're a nitrogen fixing plant and you have two options, either you fix it out of the atmosphere or you take it up from the soil, then the soil nitrogen pool seems like a very obvious regulator of how much nitrogen you're gonna fix. But I think as ecosystem ecologists, it's really important to keep in mind that just because something makes sense <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean that it's true, right? And when we start to look at in nature, 
very quickly we see patterns that put blemishes on this idea that soil nitrogen is the primary regulator of end fixation. So last year, Sasha Reed wrote this really wonderful commentary, and my favorite quote from it is, one of the most compelling aspects of symbiotic end fixation is the abundance of paradoxes that surround the process. So when you start looking at this process, very quickly a lot of things don't really make sense. And the most fundamental of these paradoxes in my mind is the one that Vitusik and Howarth laid out in that paper I just showed you. So the title of that paper was Nitrogen Limitation, How Can It Occur? And effectively they say, if symbiotic end fixation is upregulated when nitrogen is limiting and the activity of end fixers should eventually relieve nitrogen limitation, then this should be a global map of nitrogen limitation. It shouldn't occur anywhere, or at least it should be a <laughs> transient phenomenon at most, right? But of course, you're sitting in this room, so you know that this is a closer picture of a global map of end limitation. It's pretty much everywhere, especially in terrestrial ecosystems. So this is an early indication that soil nitrogen might not be the best predictor of end fixation, right? So I want to show you uh, a little more evidence that tells a similar story from my own empirical work. So my work takes place at La Selva Biological Station, which is here in northeastern Costa Rica. The first data I want to show you are from a successional gradient in these tropical forests. In this first plot, I'm going to show you soil nitrogen availability. And, and I want you to take two things away from, from this plot. So first of all, these numbers for soil nitrogen in our successional gradient are quite high. There, there's a lot of nitrogen in the soil, even relative to other nitrogen-rich tropical forests. And the other thing I want you to note is that there's not a major successional trend in these data. There's about as much nitrogen in our very young forests as there is in our old growth plots. So what this would tell us is that soil nitrogen is the primary regulator of end fixation. We would expect end fixation to be low to non-existent, and we wouldn't expect a major successional trend across our chrono sequence. But when we look at the data, actually end fixation rates are fairly high in many of our plots, and we do see this progressive downregulation of end fixation through succession. So this is some early indication that soil nitrogen might, might not be doing a great job of predicting end fixation rates. I think a better way to look at these data, though, is to, to sort of compare these two y-axes to each other. And that's what I've done here. I've got soil nitrogen on the x-axis and end fixation on the y-axis. And if soil nitrogen is the primary regulator here, we're going to expect a negative relationship across this plot. When we actually look at the data, though, it's a different story. There are only five points here, so this isn't statistically significant, but it's a positive trend. It's certainly not a negative relationship, right? Now, underlying these data are lots and lots of different soil cores, and we actually took measurements of symbiotic end fixation and soil nitrogen within each one of these soil cores. So we can look at this at a smaller spatial scale where we have higher replication. And so we've got the same axes here, end availability and uh, end fixation. Again, we would expect a negative relationship, but when we look at it, it's a very messy but positive trend, right? So this isn't working the way we think it should, at least at the plot scale. We also, we also wanted to look at this at sort of an individual plant scale. So this is from a separate study. Here we've taken 100 seedlings of nitrogen-fixing trees on the forest floor here in, in uh, Costa Rica. And we've used this metric of end fixation, which is allocation to nodules where end fixation occurs. And we've got a nitrogen gradient here on our x-axis. Again, uh, we would expect a negative relationship here, and you're not going to be surprised. Uh, but when we actually look at the data, that's not what we see. Soil nitrogen doesn't seem to be a good predictor of end fixation, at least in these plots. So I think we've got good evidence at both the, at the individual plant scale, at sort of the plot scale, and then at this sort of global conceptual scale that soil nitrogen isn't doing a great job of explaining end fixation rates in these terrestrial systems. But if it's not nitrogen, what is it? And I want to be very clear that I'm not the first person to think about this. There's been a lot of really good work on alternative candidates for what regulates end fixation in the biosphere. So other soil resources like phosphorus and molybdenum and water, temperature, the taxonomy of the plants and of the endosymbiotic bacteria. But uh, because I've commandeered the podium for a few minutes here, I'm going to talk about uh, my favorite of these alternative candidates, which is light availability. So 
again, if you are a nitrogen fixing plant, you have sort of two options. Well, nitrogen fixation is a direct alternative to taking nitrogen straight up out of the soil. So effectively, how much nitrogen is available in this soil pool determines the plant's need to fix nitrogen. But nitrogen fixation is an energetically expensive process. The plant has to give a lot of these labile carbohydrates to the bacteria in exchange for the nitrogen that it receives. And so light availability that fuels the photosynthesis of these carbohydrates, light availability largely determines the plant's ability to engage in the infixation process. So let's take a look back at those 100 seedlings on the forest floor. Again, we've got our metric of infixation here on the y-axis. And now we're looking across a gradient of light availability to each individual plant on the x-axis. If light's a strong predictor of infixation, we would expect a positive relationship here. And in fact, we do see a positive relationship. It's a noisy one, but it's a significant positive relationship. So it looks like light is a decent predictor of infixation in these plots. But we wanted to get a, more, a better mechanistic understanding of this and start teasing apart the relative effects of light and soil nitrogen. So to do that, we headed to the greenhouse to uh, sort of look at this in an experimental setting. So we conducted a nine treatment experiment. This is a three by three factorial experiment. We've got three treatments of light availability and three treatments of nitrogen availability. I'm not gonna go into the methods too deep here, but I wanna note to you that our gradient of light availability effectively represents a subset of natural conditions. We went from eight to 40% full sunlight. Our nitrogen treatments are a different story here. So all of these plants were grown in a sand soil mixture. So the low end of our nitrogen gradient is less soil nitrogen than a plant would normally experience out in the forest. And these medium and high nitrogen treatments, we blasted these plants with nitrogen. These are agricultural levels of fertilization. So effectively what we've done here is rigged our experimental design to make it easier to see effects of our nitrogen treatment than it is to see effects of our light treatment. And I want you to keep that in mind as I show you the data here. Okay, so this is how our plot's gonna be arranged. This is nitrogen fixed per plant on the y-axis. We've got three panels for our light treatment. So this is low, medium, and high light availability. And then with each, within each one of these panels, we've got low, medium, and high soil nitrogen. So if soil nitrogen is the main regulator of infixation for these plants, we're gonna expect these sort of negative trends within each one of these panels. But if light is the primary regulator of infixation, then we're gonna to expect to see sort of progressively increasing infixation rates as we move across our three panels. And when we look at the data, well, we see a bit of both, but certainly more of the second. So our plants just really didn't fix any nitrogen in these low and medium light groups. They fix quite a bit of nitrogen though in our high light group. And I wanna be clear that yes, fertilization did downregulate and fixation in our medium and high fertilization treatments in the high light group. But the effect of fertilization and the effect of a lot of fertilization was relatively small compared to the effect of light availability across our light panel. So I think we've got pretty good evidence here that light seems to be a stronger regulator of, of ni uh, nitrogen fixation than soil nitrogen is, at least in these tropical trees. But let me take you back just a moment to those observational data. So again, we've got N fixation here across a gradient of light availability. And yes, statistically, we can say that light does seem to be a fairly important driver of infixation in these plots. But I'm gonna be the first to admit, this is a pretty noisy relationship, right? We kicked off this session by noting that nitrogen is just a fiendishly complex thing, and there's a lot of complexity going on here. But I think that's an important thing to think about, right? That this, the noise around this relationship suggests that there are other things that are also driving infixation, right? We can say part of the story is light, but probably soil nitrogen is an important factor here. Phosphorus, taxonomy, those are other good candidates, I think, uh, in these systems. So the point I want to make is that this is, the regulation of infixation is obviously a really complex process. But if we go back to that quote by Sasha Reed, and we start thinking about those paradoxes that surround the, the process of infixation, if we think about that paradox of N limitation, nitrogen limitation is paradoxical if 
soil nitrogen is the primary regulator of infixation, right? If infixation is highest when soil nitrogen is scarce, and then it's down-regulated as soil nitrogen becomes more abundant. That's what makes end limitation paradoxical. If we start letting go of that assumption that soil nitrogen is the primary regulator of infixation and sort of use light or phosphorus or temperature as our null hypothesis for what regulates end fixation in the biosphere, then all of a sudden things like end limitation stop being paradoxical. Now it's still a really important question what drives end limitation and what drives inputs of symbiotic end fixation. But I think moving beyond that paradox is the first real step to really understanding and starting to be able to predict inputs of symbiotic infixation into terrestrial ecosystems. So with that, I'll get off my soapbox here <laughs> and uh, thank my collaborators, Duncan Mingy and Robin Chasden, as well as lots of folks that, that helped out with some of this research. And I guess I can take some questions. Okay, we got, we got time for questions. It's the last talk, so we don't have a, oops, don't have a hard cutoff. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, well, I'll... Sorry, I didn't hear you catch the first part. Amount of That's a really good question. We don't have good budgets for it in this system. Uh, deposition is pretty low, um, but I would say that uh, one thing that I sort of glossed over is that there is a lot, there are a ton of nitrogen fixers in these plots. In, in some of these plots, it's 30 or 40 percent nitrogen fixing trees. Um, so, you know, they're tropical forests. The demand for nitrogen is high. Primary productivity is high. Um, but there's still a lot of nitrogen in the soil and coming out of the streams in these systems. So uh, we think that the nitrogen cycle is operating in surplus, and yet these plants are still fixing nitrogen. I, um, well, I, um, I think that certainly those studies would be really interesting, but I think simply the fact that these plants are fixing nitrogen at high rates, even if they're not nitrogen limited, is sort of part of uh, illustrating the point that I, that I was trying to make. And, and let me say that in regenerating tropical forests, there's a, a good bit of evidence that uh, nitrogen is a limiting factor in, in these forests that are trying to regrow from agriculture just because nitrogen demand is so high. Um, but, but absolutely. And uh, one of the other big paradoxes that I think a lot about is why nitrogen fixation isn't much more abundant in those boreal forests that are classically nitrogen limited. Um, and I, I think soil nitrogen just isn't the right explanatory variable there, personally. Uh-huh. Yeah, and I think that, uh, personally in my view, I think that's a really uh, d great direction to start going is uh, there's some really nice work uh, coming out of Lars Adin's lab right now uh, about the sort of energetic demands of these different symbioses, so symbiotic infixation versus uh, ectomycorrhizae and AMF, and uh, where those different symbioses pay off energetically in different environments, different, uh, yeah different decomposition rates, different and availability, that sort of thing. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers and the audience. We had, uh, I estimated a peak, 115 people in the room. Yeah. And I don't know how many are watching it on demand. Um, be back here at uh, 1.40 for the beginning of stage two nitrogen saturation. So see you then. <laughs>